Thank you, Jesus. All right. Genesis 45. In the word of the Lord tonight, we're going to take up where we left off last Wednesday. Amen. The life of Joseph. But now we're going to focus primarily on Jacob, his final years. The sunset of Jacob's life. Okay? Praise God. What an awesome move of God we had Sunday morning and Sunday night. Powerful manifestation of His presence. He's an awesome God. Genesis 45 and verse 9, please. You have it? Say amen. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. He says, Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph. Now it's been 20 years since Joseph has been away from his dad. And his dad thinks that he's dead. And now he's going to send his brothers back after having embraced his brothers and showed them who he was. He's sending them back to his dad. And he's telling them this. Tell him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children. Now Goshen is also sometimes called uh, Ramesses. And thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, And you shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye lay your beast, and go get you unto the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take ye wagons out of the land of Egypt, for your little ones, and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours, And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. Don't get into a bunch of strife. Don't start fussing and fighting on the way. The Bible says in verse 25, And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive and his governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph my son is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and came to Beersheba. And offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night. And said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. 
For I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Let's pray. Father, I worship you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for your spirit, Lord God. Hallelujah. In you we live and move and have our being. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, God. Your glory is in this house tonight. We're here to honor you. We're here to praise you. We're here to worship you. We thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord Jesus, speak to this church tonight. Encourage them, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more time. Lift your voice and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, God. I worship you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you, Lord. Thank you for the anointing, God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Give you a little bit of the background here. The scripture tells us that Jacob's life, the bottom fell out of his life. He buries his beloved Rachel in Ephrata. She dies giving birth to Benjamin. She calls him Benoni. Jacob lifts him up and says, Not Benoni, the son of my pain, but the son of my power. And then he goes on a little while in life. And his own sons take the son of Rachel, Joseph, the oldest son. They put him in the pit. They take his coat, they kill an animal, they put the coat inside of the blood. They take the coat back to dad and say, Dad, a wild animal has killed Joseph. So now Joseph has, or Jacob has lost Rachel, his beloved wife. He has lost Joseph in his mind. He's dead. Time goes by, 20 years go by, there's a famine in the land. So Jacob looks up at his sons and he sends his sons to the land of Egypt because he heard there was bread in the land of Egypt. They make their way to Egypt. They get over there and they get treated harshly by the Lord of Egypt who is their brother Joseph. Joseph takes Simeon, puts Simeon in prison. Remember that represents hearing. Binds hearing up in prison. Sends the other sons back to Jacob along with, the other, with those brothers, and they go back after Benjamin. Y'all remember the story, right? And on their way back, they start opening up their sacks, and to their amazement, they find sacks full of money that they took to buy the corn. And they find the corn also, the food. And it's starting to work on them. It's starting to blow their minds. Because they can't understand why this Lord of Egypt is asking so many questions, number one. How is your dad? Is he well? Uh, is this all the brothers? Are there any more? No, we have one. His name's Benjamin. He's back home. How's Benjamin, your little brother? Well, he's okay. But the Lord of Egypt didn't believe us, so He sent us back here, Dad, to get our brother Benjamin to take him back up there. And until we show back up with Benjamin, Simeon is in prison over there. Jacob says, no, I can't let you take Benjamin. He's the only connection that I, I have to Rachel. Can't let him go. I don't want to lose him. But as time goes along, they eat all the food that they have brought from Egypt. They've run out of food and they're starting to get hungry again. So they go back to dad. Dad, we got to go back to Egypt to get some food. We're starving to death. Dad says, no, I can't let you take Benjamin. Time goes on, and it's amazing what hunger will do to you. So he looks at him and he says, I tell you what you do. He says, get Benjamin and go on back. And if I, if I am bereaved, then I'm bereaved. Go over there and let me show it to you. He said this right here. And this is in verse 14 of chapter 43. He said, And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away 
your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. He said, if I die alone, I die alone. But you've got to go get food because we're going to starve to death anyway. So I've just determined to put this all in God's hands. I've determined to cling to God. And he says, at the first part of that verse, he said, And God Almighty give you mercy before the man. El Shaddai. He said, Let El Shaddai give you mercy before the man. El Shaddai is translated here, God Almighty. That's not a very good translation. A literal translation is the breasted God. Did you hear that? Amen. The breasted God. It gives you a picture of God as a mother feeding to a feeding a child that is clinging to its breast. Jacob, Jacob says basically this. He said, I'm like a child. I've lost my strength. I'm clinging to God like a child at the breast. I am trusting El Shaddai, the breast. Now, this is a picture of God. God is not a woman, and God does not have breast. But this is a picture of God in His nurturing to man. It's a picture of Jacob clinging to God as a mother would provide for a young child. And he's there clinging to God. He's trusting God. And he's saying, let El Shaddai, the breasted God, have mercy. Let God work in this Lord's mind and His Spirit that this man would have mercy upon you. And if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. If I die alone, I die alone. See, his life, the bottom of his life has fallen out. He's lost Rachel. He's lost Joseph. And for all he knows... Benjamin's going to be gone and all the rest of his sons and he's going to die there in Canaan by himself alone. But he says, I'm going to cling to God. I'm going to cling to El Shaddai. He is the breasted God. I can trust Him to take care of my needs. I'm a broken man. My life, the bottom has fallen out of my life. Seems like my whole life's full of trouble and pain. And I'm having all kinds of difficulties. It seems like that's all my life has ever been. It's one of evil and pain and trouble. But I've got my eyes on God. I don't only have my eyes on God. But I'm clinging to El Shaddai. And so he sends his sons away with little Benjamin. 22 years old at that time. They get over there in the land of Egypt. And of course we know the story what Reuben said, you know. About, you know, when Jacob was concerned about Benjamin going over there. Reuben basically says, I tell you what, Dad. Let us go over there because we're hungry. You know, he was pretty much worthless. Reuben. Dad, we're all hungry. Now tell you what you do. If you let us go over there and you let us take Benjamin, I'm your firstborn. And you can kill my two sons if something happens to Benjamin. Have y'all read the story? I hope so. I don't have time to read all the whole story to you. Reuben said, just kill my, kill my boys. Yeah. Jacob kind of just ignores him. Okay, Reuben. Yeah. Um, I know how you are. You're unstable as water. You're about, you're about as worthless as they come. I... I'm just going to act like I didn't even hear you say that. And then Judas walks up there and he says, I'll tell you what, Dad, I'll stand in the place of Benjamin. If I've got to, I'll take his place. See, things are changing in these brothers, though. See, they're not the same brothers that took their brother and very cruelly put him in a pit and then lied to Dad and broke their father's heart. See, they have changed now. Amen. So that Reuben says, I tell you what, I'll stand in, and I'll, I'll give my own sons up for Benjamin. He really didn't mean it, but anyway. Then Judas says, I tell you what, instead of saying, let's kill him, let's stand for him. Amen. Let's stand in the place. I'll be a surety for him. I'll be a guarantee Amen. that Benjamin's coming back, even if I've got to stay. 
But remember, Dad, we got Simeon. He's over there in prison right now. Jacob probably says, now I'm kind of ad-living here. Well, let's leave Simeon there and let's keep Benjamin. Just leave him there. I don't really, you know, Reuben and Simeon, he's my second son. I don't, but Benjamin, she, uh, that's the son of Rachel. And I've already lost Joseph, who was the son of Rachel. And I cannot bear to lose another one. Just leave him over there. So these bold, strong, brave Reuben and Judah said, well, we'll take care of him, you know. Hallelujah. And then old Jacob starts praying. He says, let the breasted God touch that Lord's heart. Hallelujah. I'm clinging to this breasted God. What a beautiful picture of God is. Give God praise. God is a spirit. You do know that. And so they get over there and after being tested a little bit and Judah stands up for Benjamin and Joseph recognized that his brothers are not the same. He reveals himself to them and there's a tremendous reunion that takes place there. Hallelujah. And Joseph looks at his brothers and he says, now go get your dad. Go get father. Hadn't seen him for 20 years. I want to see dad. I want to see Jacob. And that man, Jacob, you know, as he sent them away, every day from that day that he sent them away, every morning he got up and he looked out the door and he looked out the window to see if they were going to come back or not. And then all of a sudden, one morning he gets up. Man, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. He gets up and he looks out the window and he runs up to the door. And he, just, he doesn't just see some brothers coming along with a few mules that he sent them out with. He looks up and all of a sudden he sees a wagon train. What is that? And then all of a sudden, he looks over and he sees all these wagons coming in there. And all of a sudden, he looks over and he sees some donkeys also. And they're loaded down with clothes and provision. And the wagons are loaded down with the provision, the produce of Egypt. He said, what is going on here? Hallelujah. Woo! And they drive up and they meet Jacob as he runs out the door. And they tell him that Joseph is alive. Now you can imagine what an awesome experience that must have been. Look at your own life. If you had a son that you thought was dead for 20 years. And all of a sudden, 20 years later, he showed back up on your porch and said, I haven't been dead for 20 years. I've been alive and God has exalted me up. I'm number two man in Egypt. I'm the number two man in all the world. I'm the governor in Egypt. God has done that. And they come back and they start telling daddy, daddy, Joseph's alive. What? And the Bible said his heart failed him. He almost had a heart attack right there when he heard the news. It was so awesome. See, I want to tell you that's what kind of God we serve. He's El Shaddai. He is the blessed God. He is the provider. And you may sit in your home in pain and misery and discouragement and look at your whole life as a life of nothing but trouble and pain and discouragement. But I want to tell you something. If you stay faithful to God and you keep clinging to the many breasted God, you keep holding on to God, El Shaddai. 
next Sunday he's able to send the wagons to you. And when you look out there and the wagons are coming home. And they're loaded down with provision. Woo! And they're bringing good news that Joseph is alive. And for 20 years, you sat in a place of misery for no reason at all. In your mind, he was dead. But it wasn't a reality. And God gets ready to bless. And this is too much for Jacob to handle. I mean, literally the Bible said his heart fails him. He's about to have a heart attack on this. I mean, how would you feel? You thought somebody you love was dead, and all of a sudden you find out they're alive. I'm telling you what, you. Oh, you've been suffering for 20 years, and all of a sudden God just turns it all around in one moment's time. What amazes me about Jacob, though, is this is that he's still in the game. After losing Rachel and then losing Joseph and now sending his sons away with this verdict coming from his lips, if I die alone, I die alone. I don't even have a hope anymore that anything's going to change. But I'm still going to cling to El Shaddai. It amazes me that this man is still clinging to God after everything he's gone through. If you'll keep holding on to God. You'll keep clinging to God. Someday, He's going to send the wagons to you. And your heart's going to fail for joy. By the way, I'm preaching to you the Word of God tonight. I'm not preaching to you a funny book. I'm telling you the truth, the truth as it is in God's Word. That old man, he's 130 years old. And he's dragging his leg. And he just can't believe this. And his heart's giving him problems now. Y'all are, y'all are lying to me. Uh, how can you be lying to me? Look, I see the wagons. Uh, there's something that's right about what you're telling me. I believe what you're telling me. I can see by the wagons. And I'm looking at all these beautiful clothes you brought us here. And all this provision. But Joseph looks at Jacob and said, Jacob, through the brethren, you, Jacob wants you to go to Egypt right now. He wants you to pack up and he wants you to leave Canaan. I hate to bore you with a Bible story. It don't bore me. I love it. It's awesome. But the brothers say, now, now daddy, this is all yours. This is all ours. And Joseph gave it to us. But he wants you to do one thing. He wants you to pack up. And he wants you to go to Egypt. But sons, don't you realize that this is the promised land? Don't you realize that the land we're in right now was given to Abraham? Don't you realize that this is where we're supposed to be by covenant? We're not supposed to be over there in Egypt somewhere. Don't you realize the Messiah will be born here, not in Egypt? What are you asking me to do? Y'all going to have to carry me a little bit. I don't have much voice right now. Hallelujah. I got some of that funny stuff that's going around here. Y'all going to have to help me tonight. Don't make me scream. I think for some of you, I could put dynamite underneath your seat and it wouldn't budge you. How can I leave the land of promise? How can I leave the land of Cana and go to Egypt? I'm excited about it. I want to go see Joseph. I'm so excited. I got to go see Joseph. And I'm excited about all these wagons and everything. But don't you realize this is where we're supposed to be? It's a tough decision. Walking back. Okay, I'll go. I'll go to Egypt with you. I want to see Joseph. 
and he starts making his way down to Egypt. Oh, he's got all his family. He's got 70 people that are with him. The Bible tells us right here. And they're all making their way to Egypt. About 70 of them. According to Genesis here. 70 of them plus. Okay. And they've got the babies in the wagons. And they've got the... Come on, somebody. <laughs> and they got the women in the wagons and all this stuff, you know. And they're making their way back or to Egypt. All 70 of them. You know why? Because Egypt is where God's incubation is. That's where God's going to give birth to a nation. He's got to take them down into Egypt so they can begin to grow and grow and grow into a mighty, mighty nation. It's all in the plan of God. <sighs> I got to send them through an incubation process before they can grow and become what they're going to become. So here they go. They're on their way. And all of a sudden, the Bible said, tells me in chapter right here in chapter 46 that Israel gets over to Beersheba. Give God praise. 46.1. And when he gets over to Beersheba, God, is this what you really want me to do? Do you really want me to go to Egypt? Is that what you want me to do? And all of a sudden, right there in Beersheba, God appears to Jacob in a vision. See, he, come on, I'm going to tell you something. Everything that Jacob has ever gone through was bringing him to a culmination. It was bringing him to a completion. It was bringing him to purpose. And that is the purpose of God. All of his pain, all of his bitterness was sending him to a place of purpose. How do I know that? Because this is the seventh and the final appearing of God to Jacob. God completes his purpose. And he says, Jacob, this isn't a divine appointment. Right now, this isn't an accident. I finished the works before the foundation of the world. I intended on meeting you right here in Beersheba. Before you were ever born, I intended you to be here. And so, Jacob, Jacob, let me say it again, Jacob, Jacob, two times, the double denunciation of deity, Jacob, Jacob, when you hear the double denunciation of deity, that's when God says, I'm coming in here and I'm going to take over. That's where God, who can swear by no greater than himself, so he swore by himself. He made a promise. He said, you know what, up in heaven, he said, I will do this. And then he walked up and he set up the throne and he took an oath upon the promise that he just gave. And he stated it twice and he bound it by an oath. He said it twice. So he said it once for the heavens and once for the earth. That's when God does it all by himself. That's when it's a sovereign move of God. When God says, shake up, shake up. God said, I'll come in here and I'm going to take over. Because God is a moving God. Jacob, I want you to understand something. I sent you to the land of Canaan, but you've got to realize something. I'm a moving God, and you've got to move with me because I'm a moving God. Jacob, Jacob, it's time for a change. I know you heard me when I told you to come into this land, but I'm moving, and it's time to change, and you better move with me when I move. Hallelujah. Give God praise. 
He did the same thing to his great granddaddy, Abraham. Abraham is about ready to lift the knife and come down upon Isaac. God said, Abraham, Abraham. I told you once to kill him, but now I'm moving and I've changed it. And I'm telling you, Abraham, Abraham, do the lad no harm. See, a lot of people hear the first voice of God, but they don't hear the second word. You've always got to be in tune with God. Because when he speaks to you today about something, he might tell you something different a month from now. You've always got to be in tune with God. And do what he tells you to do the first time. The first word. Until you hear the second word. But when you hear the second word, God said, I've moved and I've changed my mind. And it's time for you to move too. Jacob, Jacob! You're in my will, Jacob. Go on down to Egypt right now and watch what God tells him. He said in verse 3, Hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob, now this is in a vision. He said, here I. That's the best thing you can do when God starts calling your name. If he calls your name one time, that's awesome. But if you ever hear him call your name twice, get ready. Uh, Y'all don't even. Well, I get through preaching my message and go home and let you think about it all night long. Watch what he says. He said, I'm taking over. He said, Jacob said, here I. And he said, I God. Jacob, 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 Jacob said, here I. That's the best thing you can do when God calls you. Especially if he calls your name twice. Just sit there and say, here I. I means God's fixing to do something awesome in the earth. Something He's already declared in the heavens. He's going to come down in the earth and take over. He's fixing to do something awesome. <clears throat> you ever hear your name twice? God's fixing to do something awesome in your life. And then God said, I God. Sovereignty. Sovereignty. God doing it by himself. All I am is, here I am, God. You just come in here and you take over. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's winter time out there. And I'm hotter now than I ever was in the summertime. <clears throat> I don't understand it. It's cooler in here tonight than it ever is, and I'm burning up. I have to take my coat off in the wintertime and leave it on in the summertime. Doesn't make sense to me. See, I want to tell you something. God's still talking today. But there's a lot of people that are not listening today. There's people that come and sit in these pews. Don't expect God to do anything or say anything. They've gone through so much pain. So much suffering. They've started losing their grip off of, that, off of God. But keep clinging to God. And someday the wagons are going to come. And someday God's going to intervene. And he's going to take over the situation in your life. Watch this. Glory to God. He said, I God. Or the little word, little italics, I am God. Just I God. The God of thy father. 
Why does he emphasize all of that? I still remember the covenant, Jacob, that I made with Abraham. I spoke Abraham, Abraham. When I made that covenant, I made a promise. By two, two immutable things by which it was impossible for God to lie. Which means he said, I will do it. And then he bound himself with an oath. Two unchangeable statements of God. Abraham's already dead and he's in the grave. But because I made a promise to Abraham, I don't care what you go through or what you've gone through. I don't care what Joseph's gone through. I don't care where I put you, what part of the world I put you in. I will keep my promise that I made to Abraham. Abraham's a dead man, but the promise I gave to Abraham is alive. But really, Abraham's not dead. Because I'm the God of the living and not a God of the dead. Hallelujah, Abraham's alive. That's why in the New Testament Jesus said this. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Which means I'm the God of the living and not a God of the dead. And if you're dead tonight, you don't know the God I know. Because he's a God of the living and not a God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's still talking today. He said, I, God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. I'll keep you wherever you go. I'm not just a ge geographical God. When you leave Canaan, you're not leaving me back in Canaan. Because I'm not just a geographical God in Canaan. I'm the eternal, omnipresent, ever-present, all-knowing God. Who is a God of the living and not a God of the dead. And you've stayed in the game for 20 years of bad news. You stayed in the game and you kept clinging to me. And because of that, that covenant that I made with Abraham is going to come to pass in your life and in your son's life. Keep clinging to God. Hallelujah. Oh, God's awesome. And he's in this house tonight. He's a mighty God. He deserves to be lived for. Oh, I can't go by what I feel like. I can't go by what the circumstances say. I got to get a hold of God tonight. He's El Shaddai. He's almighty. He's the best of God. See, most people put faith in the wrong thing. They put faith in their sickness. I don't feel good tonight, so I'm going to stay home. <laughs> I don't feel good tonight, so I just can't preach tonight. <laughs> oh, poor little me. You got more faith in the devil than you do God. You got more faith in your sickness than you do God. You got more faith in your problem than you do God. He's a God of the living and not a God of the dead. He's El Shaddai. Start putting your faith in a covenant-keeping God, a God that keeps his promises. Lord, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. But don't you know there's about 60,000 deities in Egypt? I mean, they worship everything from the frog to gnats to the sky to the ground to the river Nile. 
to the cows that worship fire. The Lord don't change it. We're just going to keep on moving from Genesis right on into Exodus. And if He don't change that, we're just going to keep on moving right into Leviticus and then Numbers, then Deuteronomy. Yeah, but they've never met the only God. They just got a glimpse of him in Joseph. They just heard his name from the mouth of Joseph. But I'm fixing to send the whole church into Egypt. And when I get ready to send the church into Egypt, they're going to come face to face with El Shaddai. God Almighty. Oh, God's awesome. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. For I will. Notice, this is all about him. He said, I will. I, God, I will. Now, this is awesome. He said, I will there make of thee a great nation. In Egypt. You're going to put us in your incubator in Egypt and cause us to multiply into a great nation in Egypt, God? Our faith is so little. You mean God's surrounded by 60,000 deities and you're going to cause the Hebrew nation about 70 or more people to multiply into a great nation in a foreign country surrounded by foreign deities? God said, that's what I said. Because you fail to understand that I'm a living God, I'm supernatural, and I'm not just natural. You need to look at Him as supernatural, not just natural. Jacob, just exercise your faith just a little bit. Don't think so small. Start thinking big. Because I'm a big God. We need to get rid of the little bitty thinkers and get some big thinking in this house. Hallelujah. Verse 4, he said, I will go down with thee. See, you're not going to go by yourself. Every step you take and all these wagons that are rolling, I'm going to be right there with you. My glory's going to be there. Every step you take, I'm going to take. When you walk into Egypt, I'm walking into Egypt with you. That's how it's going to happen. Oh, God's good. Give God praise in this house. We are still serving the God that gave this message in the Old Testament. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he said, I'm going to go down with you in Egypt after I get you out of the incubator. Then I'm going to bring you out. Well, God, why would you send me in there to bring me out? Because I have to get you to understand that I'm a moving God. And I've got a purpose because I just don't want to save a few Hebrews. I want to save Egypt. God just don't want us foreign no more. He wants to fill this whole complex with people. He wants to save all of Odessa, not just a couple of us. God gave us a commission Sunday night for everybody here to go out and preach the gospel. I want you to know God started pointing the finger at me and said, okay, you, you declared it, now do it. So I, I did my part. 
I just pray that you obey God and you went out there and preached this gospel. But what you got to understand, when you go out there in Egypt, in the world, you're not going by yourself, but God is with you. God's doing some big things. Now watch this. He said, I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. You're not even going to see the promise. You're not going to see it with your eyes. You're not going to see this big nation growing up inside of Egypt. You're not going to see the covenant that I made with Abraham come to pass. But I still made the promise to you. And that's why later on when Jacob gets ready to die, he said, don't leave me in Egypt. When y'all get ready to leave, take me with you. You know what he's saying? I might not see it with my eyes, but I know prophetically it's going to happen. And I put my faith in El Shaddai, and I cling to him even in death. I hold on to the promise even in death. Hallelujah. He's awesome. And so you keep reading 46. The Bible said they load up their whole family. And it gives all the names of all the children, you know. And I kind of like the names of Benjamin's, of Benjamin's children. Y'all read the names of Benjamin's children? I love, you know what? God's a God. He's got a sense of humor, man. He'd have to have a sense of humor to put up with me. He'd have to have a sense of humor to put up with you. And Betcher and Ashbel and Gilra and Naaman and Ehi and Rosh and here here we go Muppin and Huppin <laughs> Muppin and Huppin Hallelujah He was probably the, they were probably the brothers of Ithiel and Ukko <laughs> We talked about Ithiel and Ukko Ukko uh, Sunday night. Hey, I got some brothers. Hoop them, or hoop them, and mop them. I can't take all of that face like that. God's awesome, man. I bet their names mean something pretty powerful, though. Would you like to know what they mean? Go look them up. I don't know what they mean. I can't tell you everything. I don't know what they mean, Daniel. Praise God. But this is exciting. Because you've got good news in Jacob's house and he's pretty happy and now God's talking to him and telling him what he's going to do. And he's got all of his kids with him. He's... But he's still got his own lip. He's still dragging his leg. And there's a reason for that. And you'll see it in a little bit. So anyway, it tells us, verse 27, that about 70 of them go up. Now he's 130 years old right now. Jacob is. And verse 29, here we go. Here is the reunion. 20 years Jacob hasn't seen his beloved firstborn son of Rachel, his beloved wife. 20 years he hadn't seen him. I wonder what he looks like. Wow. When I saw him last, he was only 17 years old. Now he's about 37 at least. Probably 39. You know what? I'm having so much fun. Y'all look like, look, like look like somebody died in your family. I love to preach. Hallelujah. If, if I was preaching to it, the charisma talk. Ah. <laughs> I 
but I'm preaching the oneness, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost field, Pentecostals in Odessa, Texas. But here he comes. And he's right in a chariot. And he's wearing royal apparel. And I really haven't touched the typical application, but you do realize that someday Israel's going to be reunited with Jesus. And when he comes back, he's coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He rides that old chariot up there. He dismounts. Hallelujah. He walks over there to his daddy that he hadn't seen for 20, 22 years. And he grabs him around the neck. And they stand there for a long while, the Bible says, hugging one another. And Joseph says, Daddy, he says, you're right, Daddy. God is a God of love. You're right, Daddy. He is El Shaddai. He does keep His promises. Look what He's done for me, Daddy. Look how He's brought us together. You were right, Daddy. You told me to keep clinging on to God. I kept holding on to Him. And look what He's done for me. And they're crying on each other's neck. Hallelujah. What a beautiful thing. That's what God can do in your life. He can take impossible situations, great pain and suffering, and turn them around to great rejoicing and great victory and great happiness. But I want to tell you what you got to do in the meantime. You got to keep clinging on to God. You can't lose your faith. You can't allow yourself to get discouraged. You can't allow yourself to get apathetic and complacent and Laodicea and lukewarm. You gotta keep your faith alive. See, Jacob's faith is a faith that is resting. If I die, I die. But I'm gonna rest in faith and I'm gonna trust God because I know that God's got to be in this somewhere. He made promises to Abraham. He's in this somewhere, somehow. I don't understand it all. But I'm going to rest in faith. And I'm going to keep clinging in the, on to God. And God's going to turn it all around for me in the end. And then I will understand. Give God a hand clap. Watch this, verse 30. And Israel said unto Joseph, now let me die since I have seen thy face because thou art yet alive. And God gives the old, the old guy 17 more years. Joseph walks up there and he says, I'll tell you what, here's the plan. The plan is this. I got to take care of y'all for five more years. There's still famine, you know, in the land. But I got to take care. Why are y'all so happy? Hallelujah. Goodness. I could understand it if I, could, if I was preaching damnation hell. But I'm preaching you the gospel. You sit there and look at me. With this old sour look on you. I can't figure you out. You're happy when I preach hell and you're mad when I preach the gospel. I don't understand. <laughs> Glory to God. Back in my days in church, I'd have paid you a million dollars to hear a message like this. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Every time I went to church, I didn't want to climb on the altar. I wanted to climb under it. <laughs> but I needed it. I needed it, man. I was a real problem. I needed it. Some of you do too. That's why I preach like I do to you. Hallelujah. Here's the plan. We're going to go up there. And, and Jacob, I'm going to greet. I'm going to show you to, to Pharaoh. I'm going to introduce you to Pharaoh. And I tell you what, here's what we got to tell him when we get there. We got to tell Pharaoh that we're all shepherds. That's the plan. Because I'll tell you why we got to tell Pharaoh that we're shepherds. Because Egyptians hate pastors. E Egyptians hate pastors. That's my translation. The Bible said they hate shepherds. But a pastor is a shepherd. People in the world hate men of God. They hate pastors. They hate the fivefold ministry. They can't stand them. I can tell a person who's got the spirit of an Egyptian just like that by the way they relate to ministry. Because worldly people hate pastors. They hate shepherds. They got a spirit of an Egyptian. How many Egyptians I got in here tonight? All the Egyptians said, Amen. Not enough power. <laughs> How many of y'all love shepherds? <clears throat> Only Egyptians have problems with pastors. So we go to tell them we're shepherds. So that they'll put us over in Goshen somewhere. Give God some praise. And we'll be set apart from Egypt. And we won't intermarry with the Egyptians. And we won't worship their gods. But we'll have an influence on their society. Come on, Jacob. I mean, come on, Father. Says Joseph. Where are we going, son? We're going to go see Pharaoh. Son, I'm a 130-year-old man, and I'm just an old stinky shepherd. And you want to take me in the presence of royalty? You want me to take, you want me to go where? In a palace? With all this ancient civilization's pomp and glory? With the Lord of the earth sitting on the throne? Pharaoh, who claims to be Ra, the sun god, the one who claims to be the light of the world. You want me to do what, son? You want to take me in the presence of that man? I'm a stinking shepherd. Yeah, come on, Dad, because they're excited. Pharaoh's excited about you, Dad. Pharaoh's excited about all my brothers. He's the one that sent all... He's the one that told me to get all these wagons. He's the one that told me to get all the mules and load them up with all these beautiful clothes for you. He's the one that sent the provision. He's the one that told me to do all this. Oh, okay. I'll go in there. So he walks in there in the presence of Pharaoh. Still dragging that leg. Y'all remember why, don't you? Yes. Why is he still dragging that old leg around? Because one day he had an encounter with this God and he said, God, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And he wrestled with the angel. 
And the angel blessed him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel, which means as a prince thou hast power with God. You're blessed, Jacob. You're Israel. You've got power with God. As a sign of that, that he had lost his strength and received the endued power of God. God touched the hell of his thigh. And as a symbol of that, that he's lost his own strength, that he's got the power of God in his life. He's a blessed man, able to bless others. God touched his thigh. Now he walks with the leg that drags behind him. I'm almost through. And he walks in the presence of Pharaoh. Can you just imagine that? Y'all are tired, aren't you? <laughs> all that gold and all those false deities around his throne. He's sitting up there with a, the serpent on his head. symbol of Antichrist, Leviathan, the serpent upon his head. And, all, and he says, I'm God. Pharaoh says, I'm God. And here comes this stinky shepherd named Jacob, Israel. And you know what he does? He walks over there to that Pharaoh and he puts his hand on his head. And he blesses him. <laughs> Watch, I'll read it to you. Don't believe me? Chapter 46. Verse 7, and Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And the way you bless people in the Old Testament is you lay hands on them. This stinky old 130-year-old man, he's got the power of God in his life. And he's not intimidated by men. He's not intimidated by a man who claims to be God because he knows the one true God of the Bible. <laughs> he blessed Pharaoh. Jacob, what are you, blind? Don't you see this palace this man has? Don't you understand that he, he's going to own everything? And you're, you're blessing him? Mm, you lost your mind, Jacob. What is a blessing? We talked about it last week. It's not something that just makes you happy. A blessing... The word blessing in the Hebrew means to be endued with power. And Jacob walks it up to that old false God, lays his hands on him, and he says, Be endued with the power of God. You're really not blessed until you know the true God, Jacob says. And I've come here. Hallelujah to show you the true God. How you truly get best is to know God. I know you got a lot of worldly gold. I know you got a lot of worldly stuff here. But hey, that's nothing without God's power. <laughs> He's saying, let God bless you spiritually. Amen. You bow down to all these deities and drive yourself crazy by doing it and there's no life in it. You okay? 
Are you hurting? Okay. But you need God. All these deities are not going to bless you spiritually. So be blessed spiritually. I pray that you're successful and you're prosperous spiritually. Which means that you walk with God successfully. Pharaoh, you need to walk with God successfully. You need to be touched in your spirit. Pharaoh, you need to be endued with power, power to succeed and prosper mentally. You need to learn how to walk in the wisdom of God. I bless you that you be endued with power to succeed emotionally. Give God praise. That you would know the love of God in your emotions. I bless you that your body would be healed from all sickness. You cannot bless anybody until you are first blessed. Which means you've lost your own strength. You have to lose your own strength. And be blessed. I'll not let you go till you bless me. And once you're blessed, then you can be a blessing. But until you've lost your own strength, you walk around like this. God bless me. What are you going to do for me, God? But this man, Jacob, has gone beyond the time where he's saying, bless me. He walks up to Pharaoh and he says, bless Pharaoh. Because he lost his strength and received the blessing of God. Now everywhere he goes, he's involved in how can I bless this one? How can I help this one? How can I bless that one? How can I bless that one? He's a mature man of God now. It's taken God a hundred years to get Jacob. To a point that he's got so much God he can walk in the presence of Pharaoh and have enough of the power of God in his life that he'll lay hands on a self-professed deity and says, God bless you. And then, after he gets through talking, I'll tell you what, I, I, I just wonder... When Jacob laid his hand on Pharaoh. I just wonder if old Jacob started speaking in tongues. But, but I know he didn't, because that's a New Testament experience. But I tell you one thing, I bet when he laid hands on Pharaoh, that fire went through him. Because he had been touched by a man of God who had clung to God through everything and had learned to die and resurrected in power. willing to trust God with everything. If I die alone, I die alone. But I'm going to keep holding on to El Shaddai. I'm going to keep clinging to him. I'm going to rest in my faith. So after all that, 
Pharaoh. I could just see old Pharaoh sitting on the throne shaking. What was that? <laughs> when Jacob first walked in, he said, Who, Who's that? But after Jacob laid hands on him, Israel, Israel laid hands on him. And when Israel laid hands on him, he said, What was that? Glory to God! Hallelujah! And what you need to understand today is that you've got that same God inside of you. And at some point, you've gone through so much, but you've got to learn to just be like a baby. Say, oh God. I'm going to trust you. <laughs> because I know the weaker I get in my own self, the weaker my flesh gets, the more broken I become. Something starts working in my life that is supernatural and very, very powerful. It's the ability to lay hands on people that they're blessed spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. That's powerful. But anybody that's touched by God walks with the limp. I'm going to tell you something I haven't felt. Listen, we felt the move of God Sunday night, but there's a deeper move of God tonight. There is a deeper move of the Spirit. This is deeper tonight than it was Sunday. <sighs> Give God praise. <laughs> now watch. I'm going to show you. Verse 8. Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old are you? I don't feel like I've been touched by a 130-year-old man. It seems to me like your hand was an extension of somebody else. I'm 130 years old. Give God some praise. <laughs> Notice what he goes on and tells him. He said in verse 9, And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. He said they're few, and he said they're evil. He said my whole life's been pain. My whole life's been brokenness. My whole life's been disappointment. <laughs> but I wouldn't give up any of it yeah. to be where I am right now. I wouldn't give up any of that that I might lay hands on the sick and that they might recover. And that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. It's worth it all. Give God praise. I love this man because he's so truthful and he's so real, but he's clinging to God in reality. He don't get up and say, hey, Pharaoh, well, I've been blessed all my life. Hallelujah. Everything's been good. No problems, no difficulties, no struggles. He said, my whole life's been one of struggle. My whole life's been one of disappointment and pain and suffering. Bless me, Pharaoh. But I know God. See, you need to understand something when you go to your job and you see maybe your boss with all that... Pop and that, all of that. 
you walk in there at that bank and that bank president's right there. If you are where Jacob was, you can walk up to him and impart blessing. And then you turn around, walk around, and say, walk away, and they say, who was that little lady? Who was that little man? Who was that teenage young man? Who was that little girl? I like this. This just comes to me. You know what? Where is that? Where's uh, Jacqueline? Asleep. She's a disappointment to the Pentecostal faith. A disappointment to the Pentecostal faith. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> She's something else. I'll tell you what. If I ever get in the debate, I'm going to go get little Jacqueline and my little girl Victoria. And I'm going to take them with me. And I'm going to let them cut them up. <laughs> Y'all go ask Valerie. What, what, what Jacqueline's been saying here lately. <laughs> she got the whole school system shaken up. I go get her. Hallelujah. I just step back. Go at him, Sister Jacqueline. <laughs> Jackie. How old is she? What, six? Seven years old, man. So you want to raise these kids up in the kingdom? And you want to be an example to them everywhere you go. Don't be a hypocrite. Be an example to your children. Be a Jacob. Joseph said, I got to show my daddy off. He's a man of God. And after, what's this? He said, my all my days have been evil. He said, the days of the years of my life been, they have not attained the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of the pilgrimage. And now, and I'm almost there. He walks back up there. And he lays hands on him again. And he said, bless me, Pharaoh. <laughs> He's a man of God now. He's been through a lot. Give God some praise. He's suffered a lot. He walks with a limb now, but he's got power with God because his name is Israel, not Jacob. He's changed. And that's what everybody in here is looking for. Every young lady, every young man, every... Old lady, we don't have any of those. <laughs> Every old man, <laughs> we don't have any of them. That's what you're looking for. But you can't bail out. You got to keep clinging. Because God is in this somehow. Some way, I don't really understand how, but I know God's made some promises to His church and He's in this somehow, some way. And they walk out of Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh was never the same man again. He might have kept bowing down to his false gods. But he never fought. I forgot the encounter with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And about 215 years from now, another man by the name of Moses is going to rise up. And he's going to be carrying a rod, which represents power. And he's going to walk in another Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh, who knew not Moses, I knew not Joseph, 
but there's the power of God again. Yeah. Jacob walks out. He and his sons, they go over to Goshen, and they're blessed. And they incubate, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. In the furnace of affliction, they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And, they grow. and Joseph, five years in a famine, he just keeps feeding them, keeps sending supplies to them. And the Egyptians, they run out of money. I'm almost through. I got to get to 48, which brings us to the dying Jacob. But we're in 47 right now. And so money, not any good anymore. They run out of money. So they can't buy food anymore. So Jacob, Joseph says, I'll tell you what you do then. I tell you, bring all your cattle to me. So they bring all the cattle to Joseph for Pharaoh. And then they run out of all the cattle. And they go back to Joseph. Joseph, we're going to die. What if we run out of money. We run out of cattle. What we can do? What we can do. That sounds like Hispanic, don't it? What we can do. <laughs> what we can do. What we can <laughs> What can we do? <laughs> well, give me all your land. And I'll give you bread. Give you bread, okay? Okay. Well, they gave him all the land and ran out of food. Walked back up there to Joseph. What can we do? I tell you what, I'm going to give you some seed. And you go out there and you plant all that land that's Pharaoh's now. You plant seed in that earth that is Pharaoh's now. And when it comes up, you bring 20% to the Lord. You bring a fifth part to the Lord because He owns it all. 20%. I can't pay my 10%. That's why you're starving. But that's, a, you know, another message. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's good, isn't he? Give God a hand clap of praise. And be blessed in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Give him some praise. He's so awesome. He's great. Give me some music, brother. Give me some music. Hallelujah. Oh, just in time. Just in time. Come on up here in the front, please. Everybody come to the front. Lift your hands and love Jesus. And be blessed. Be blessed.